course, Sam's accomplishments are entirely his own. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, give a little bit of lead up, and then, then, well, we'll see what I'm going to do. Um, well, this is, I can't read my slides from here. I have to look backwards, so I just have to stand. Um, okay, so the starting point for the talk is the following question. It's a physical question. How, in fact, do small bodies move in general relativity? And there's an immediate answer to this, um, which you find in any textbook on the theory, um, which is that in the absence of external forces, small bodies, massive point particles, will traverse time like GD6. Um, and light rays will traverse null GD6. Often these are separated from one another to Principles, but in both cases we have a principle of GDC motion. Now, there's a, a long and uh, distinguished history of physicists and philosophers of physics thinking about the status of this sort of principle. Um, so, anyone who can identify all of the people uh, in this collage uh, know, will get. Get something, I guess. Um, your pride. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, there's an idea that goes back to very early in the history of relativity, um, uh, due to people like Einstein and Eddington and Einstein's collaborators, uh, Infeld, Hoffman, Romer, and so on, that we really shouldn't think of the geodesic principle as a principle. We should think of the geodesic principle as, in some sense, a theorem um, that somehow it should follow from other ideas in relativity theory that in the absence of an external force, small bodies should follow um, G D6. Now, there are difficulties with that, however, and this is why, you know, now 100 years later, uh, people are still writing papers on the problem of motion in general relativity. Because, among other things, um, the geodesic principle, as I just stated it, is a principle about point particles, whereas the things that we generally encounter in relativity theory are smooth fields satisfying some differential equations. And so um, there's some work that goes into making precise what we even mean by uh, the motion of a small body in the context of, of a field theory. Um, all, of the diff all of the words here become difficult. Motion is a difficult concept to make precise in a context where you incur space-time where you don't have, say, a center of mass world line. Uh, particle is a notion that's difficult to make sense of, and, and so on. GAB seems pretty clear. That's cool. um, okay, so what I'm going to do is um, uh, three things. One, I'm going to discuss two approaches that uh, are in the literature on how to establish the GDC principles of theorem, and I'm going to complain about both of them. Um, I'm going to say some things that are nice about both of them, but I'm ultimately going to say that there are, there are issues with both of them. Uh, and then I'm going to present some new work um, that gives, uh, I think, a better way of thinking about these results. And um, so th that's going to be mostly, in the first part will be a little bit of philosophy, the second part will be mostly mathematical physics, and then the third part will be uh, some, more, some more philosophy, what, what all this means. Um, and so I should be, I should acknowledge a collaborator here, so Bob Garish and I uh, are writing a paper on this, and this is, it's essentially done um, what I'm presenting in the first two sections. Uh, this is a very dashing picture of Bob, of the, you can see it. Um, uh, I actually cut Sam Fletcher out of <laughs> <laughs> Sam's pose wasn't. Uh, uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, so the, the first the first two parts of the talk are based on um, joint work with Bob, uh, uh, and the third part is is not. And I would not besmirch his reputation by suggesting that he endorses any of what I say in the third part. Um, the first two parts, I think. Okay, so begin by talking about two approaches to these sorts of results. Well, 
One approach, which has um, a very long history, it goes back to uh, the 1940s, Myron Matheson's work was developed by others like, like Suryao and Sternberg and Willemann, um, is to observe that there's a very short argument for GPC motion that begins with distributions. So distributions in the sense of mathematical theory that makes precise motions like a delta function. So the idea is that we represent um, a small body with energy momentum distribution supported on some curve. Basically say like a point particle is like a delta function. Um, we say that this distribution has to satisfy some conditions. It has to be divergence free if we're going to capture the notion of a free particle. Um, and it has to be order zero. That ends up doing a lot of work here, I'll come back to it. It follows from those two assumptions, that the distribution is order zero, divergence free, that it has this very specific form. It's some constant m times the tangent vector to the curve twice times a delta function supported on that curve. Okay, so this is a very intuitive way of thinking about what a point particle is. Um, it follows from that, the fact that, that the stress energy takes this form, that the curve has to be a geodesic. The only curves, the only time-like curves that support this sort of distribution are time-like geodesic. So this is like a two-line proof that small bodies follow geodesic. Um, so this has some advantages. The first advantage is that it's extremely simple. Um, and because it's so simple, it's very easy to generalize. You can give a, a nice treatment of forces much more generally by thinking about distributions in this way. So just for example, um, this takes a little bit more work to, to get all the ideas in place, but, but the output is, is pretty straightforward. Um, if you suppose that the, the curve is, I'm sorry, if you suppose that the distribution is not divergence free, um, then you get an effect that mass times acceleration equals the spatial part of the divergence. So that's nice, right? You get F equals MA. Um, the temporal part of the divergence uh, can be thought of as a kind of mass exchange. Um, and so if you've got uh, uh, some body undergoing some forces, it's, that it's possible that, that it will exchange some mass with its environment, and that will also influence its, its motion. Um, but we get these two, these two expressions that capture the force case, very simply. Um, and then we can look at specific forces. So for instance, if you fix some background electromagnetic field, you represent a charged body by a distributional energy momentum tensor supported on this curve. Um, and you suppose that you have, say, an order zero charge current density also supported on the curve. You assume charge conservation. Uh, and uh, this, this expression um, uh, for the divergence of T, you get that J must be, uh, have, have this very simple form. The charge current density is just a, a charge, a constant charge, times a delta function. Um, the energy momentum tensor has the, this point particle form. And moreover, that gamma must be a Lorentz force curve with charge to mass ratio E over M. So everything works out the way you'd expect. Now, you can in fact go further uh, this is one of the ways in which you can actually learn something from this sort of approach, and instead of just recovering things that we thought we already knew. Um, the assumption that the energy momentum tensor is order zero uh, means that its divergence can be at most order one. Um, because F the, is the, the background electromagnetic field, is a smooth field, it follows that J, the charge current density, can be at most order one. And so in fact, you can give a complete treatment of what curves can support uh, a, an order zero distribution um, whose divergence is equal to a smooth field times an order one distribution supported on that curve. Um, and what you find is that the motion of the body depends on things like a dipole moment times the gradient of the electromagnetic field. The, the sorts of things, again, that you would expect if you can give a, a complete treatment in this case. Okay, so, so much for the advantages. Um, here are some disadvantages. 
situation, I would say, is not entirely satisfactory. Okay, so here's the first concern. We've assumed from the outset that matter is represented by an ordered zero distribution. Um, what does that mean? Well, order zero distributions are ones that, uh, whose action can be extended from smooth fields to merely continuous fields. So the idea here is that uh, an order zero distribution might be the sort of thing generated by a smooth field on spacetime or a delta function. But you can consider more general distributions, like, for instance, the derivative of a delta function. The derivative of a delta function uh, doesn't act on continuous test fields. It's only defined for at least uh, C1 test fields. The second derivative of a delta function is also a distribution that can be defined at a point, a curve, or other regions. That can only be defined on C2 or higher differentiable test fields, and so on. Um, now, so you might think, assuming from the outset that our body is represented by an order zero distribution, where I spell that order zero in terms of action on these test fields is physically obscure. It's not clear what we're assuming about matter when we assume that. And that really is essential to getting the sorts of results that I just described. Um, and, okay, so here's, here's a justification for that assumption. Um, we can define a version of an energy condition for distribution. We do it in the following way. Um, we define a special class of smooth test fields. Um, the idea is that one way of thinking about the dominant energy condition uh, is that it um, defines a cone of tensors at a point. Um, it's the tensors whose action on another particular class of tensors, the dual cone, yields a positive number. Um, what are the elements of the dual cone? Well, they're Tensors that can be written as a sum of exterior products of causal tensors, uh, causal vectors, right? So dominant energy condition says you know T and B contracted with C eta, where C and eta are both co-oriented causal vectors is a positive number. So that's telling me that all of the tensors that can be written as a sum over exterior products or as a, a, a convex sum over exterior products of causal vector co-oriented causal vectors are going to also yield a positive number when we act on, on them with T. Um, and so let's just generalize that notion to distributions and say, well, let's consider now the class of smooth test functions, which at every point can be written in this particular way. And then I'll say that a distribution satisfies the dominant energy condition. <laughs> if it's the case that the action of that distribution on any of these uh, test functions, any of the, the, the test functions that satisfy this dual energy condition. Oh, new updates, that's great. <laughs> um, it's positive. Uh, <laughs> okay, so that gives us a, a, an extension of the, the dominant energy condition that applies to uh, distributions. Um, and then we get the following result. Suppose that I have a symmetric distribution satisfying the dominant energy condition in the sense it follows that that distribution is order zero. And so really what's going on then when I assume that uh, the uh, distributional energy momentum supported on a curve representing a point particle is both order zero and divergence free, is I'm saying, or at least it's sufficient for me to assume that it satisfies this energy condition and it's divergence for it. So insofar as you think the energy condition is uh, a reasonable or interesting um, uh, assumption uh, for matter, then we can make physical sense of that modeling assumption. Um, okay, but here's another concern. Um, we want to think about matter in relativity, usually, um, as represented by smooth fields on space-time. And so, although it's the case that a distributional energy momentum uh, can capture in a natural way our idea about what a point particle is, we still haven't answered the question of in what way any kind of point particle representation of matter is supposed to um, correspond to or approximate or um, otherwise relate to 
the sort of smooth fields, like the electromagnetic field, things like that, that we um, might have thought had a, a, a more primary status within the theory. Um, in fact, uh, the situation is a little bit worse. And so suppose that you had some hyperbolic system, say Maxwell equations. And suppose that you wanted to consider point particle-like solutions to those equations. It's perfectly coherent to think about distributional solutions to a partial differential equation. Suppose you have such a thing, and suppose it's supported on a curve, so you've got some point particle made out of that sort of matter. Try to define its energy momentum tensor. It's not going to work. The reason it's not going to work is that the energy momentum tensor is generally quadratic in fields and their derivatives. You can't multiply distributions. You can't multiply distributions because the result is, is ambiguous, um, generally. You just, there's no action on, on test fields defined by the product of um, and so, even if you had distributional solutions to your field equations, uh, you wouldn't end up thereby with a distributional energy momentum tensor. Of course, if you have a smooth field as a solution to your differential equations, you're also not going to end up with a distributional energy momentum tensor supported on the curve. And so, what kind of matter could possibly be associated with this sort of distributional energy momentum tensor? Um, okay, so that's the first concern. Here's the second concern. Um, there are well-known difficulties associated with uh, using distributional energy momentum tensors as sources in Einstein's equation. So in particular, there's this paper from the 1980s by Garrosh and, and Jenny Troshan um, that showed that there are no metrics at all satisfying certain very weak natural-looking conditions. Um, which are compatible with distributional sources supported on a curve or on a two-dimensional surface. And so um, this has practical consequences um, because one of the things that you might like to do in your account of geodesic motion is try to give a treatment of how back reaction. So you know, for instance, you've got this particle that's moving near some other bodies, Perhaps it's emitting some gravitational radiation. You might think that that's going to influence its motion. Perhaps it'll, that'll influence its motion even in the limit. You might try to uh, derive something analogous to, say, the um, uh, Abraham Lorentz force law for um, uh, uh, small particles interacting gravitationally. Um, it's, it's looking pretty hopeless to do that sort of thing with a purely distributional. Uh, approach simply because we have no way of thinking about uh, distributional sources in the context of Einstein's approach. Okay, and so the short story is that it's not really clear, even after we've said this thing about the relationship between the energy condition and being order zero, uh, in what sense a distributional energy momentum tensor can represent realistic matter. Okay, here's another approach. I'm going to call the curve first approach. Um, this was developed by Garrosh, um, by Feng Su Yang, uh, Jurgen Ehlers, um, Wald, and, and Grala more recently, where you begin with a curve in some space time, and then you consider smooth fields, um, smooth energy momentum fields, so smooth symmetric tensors that are supported in small neighborhoods of that curve. You can then get the following theorem. Um, suppose that gamma is a smooth kind of like curve in space time mg. Suppose that in any neighborhood of that curve, no matter how small, I can find some smooth symmetric divergence free non vanishing tensor field satisfying the dominant energy condition whose support lies entirely within that neighborhood. It follows that gamma is a geodesic. Now, the interpretation of this is supposed to be that the only curves along which arbitrarily small bodies can propagate are time-like geodesics. So I get this result without supposing that there's anything actually supported on the curve or that there's anything restricted to the curve. I'm only considering smooth fields here. Now, this approach is also simple, um, perhaps not as simple. The, the paper in which the theorem is first presented is two pages long, but that's quite a bit longer than the two lines it took to get the distributional result. 
Um, now, it solves at least one of the problems associated with the distributional approach, which is that I'm only considering smooth energy momentum tensors, and so it, it's clearer what the relationship between these sorts of fields and more realistic matter or other sorts of matter that we encounter in relativity is supposed to be. Um, and perhaps most importantly, smooth energy momentum fields can of course be sources in Einstein's equation. And so I can adapt this sort of result uh, to consider back reaction. And in fact, I can show that um, in an appropriate limit, even if I consider back reaction, I still get geodesic motion. And so one way of thinking about this is that, that to zero order, I always get geodesic motion. So this is a, a result from 2004 due to Jürgen Ehlers and Bob Garish um, uh, that accomplishes that. So the idea is that I, I once again start with a curve and I consider once again small neighborhoods of that curve and I suppose that within those small neighborhoods, I can always find a metric whose Einstein tensor is uh, non-vanishing just within that neighborhood. Um, and so I think of that as a, an exact solution corresponding to a small body um, and the, the sense in which um, so the, the topological notion here, the idea that I have a C1 neighborhood of my background metric is capturing the idea that these are small bodies that can be made arbitrarily small in mass such that their contribution to the background geometry is made small in the limit, even though at every step of the limit, uh, the implied limit here, um, uh, I'm fully accounting for the contribution uh, of the matter to the geometry. Okay, but again, there are problems. So, here's the first thing. I just told this very nice story about how to think about forces, including, for instance, the Lorentz force, um, using distributions. Can I do anything like that with the curve first approach? Well, it, it's not so clear. Um, the reason it's not so clear is that it turned out that when I'm actually working in the limit, right, when I'm actually working with the distributional energy momentum tensor, um, the sorts of assumptions that seem reasonable, right, that the thing is divergence-free and that it satisfies the energy condition, puts extremely strong constraints on the form that the distribution can take. Um, it also puts extremely strong constraints on the force, right, because the force, as I said, can be at most order one. Um, and that allows me to give a more or less completely general treatment of motion. But as soon as I allow for extended matter, uh, things go completely wild. Um, I can have all sorts of rotational degrees of freedom, I can have mass multipoles. Um, all of that stuff ends up getting washed out in the limit. I don't have the degrees of freedom in, with the distribution to, to talk about that stuff. But once I'm, I'm thinking about the extended fields, it's much less clear uh, how to control those extra degrees of freedom. Um, and so the question is, what further constraints do I need to place on a, a collection of smooth fields or a sequence of smooth fields um, in order to approximate the sorts of things that happen in the limit? Um, here's the second concern that, in my mind at least, is the bigger one, and maybe the most important thing here. Um, it's that even though, on this approach, I'm talking about smooth energy momentum tensors, there's still uh, a sense in which the connection to realistic matter is unclear. What I have in mind is that, so here's a perspective on relativity theory. Um, matter in this theory is represented by solutions to hyperbolic systems. You'd like the hyperbolic systems to have some properties, you'd like them, for instance, to have causal cones that correspond to the metric-like cones. Um, uh, but in the end, matter's going to do what matter's going to do. It's described by some differential equations. Um, we'd like to be able to think about, for instance, solutions to coupled, you know, Einstein-Maxwell, Einstein-Klein-Gordon, Einstein-whatever systems of equations. Um, and we'd like it to be the case that when we model matter in the theory for the purposes of something like the geodesic principle, that I could begin with a solution to some hyperbolic system, say, a solution to Maxwell's equations. And that's exactly what I cannot do 
with these curve first results. And the reason is that I suppose from the get go that matter can be made to vanish outside of an open neighborhood containing the curves. Um, if you can find a solution to Maxwell's equations that does that, uh, you'll be very famous, I think. Um, it's just not generally possible in the hyperbolic system. Generally, you're going to have things propagating out uh, along the causal cones of the, the system, right? Along the null cones in the Maxwell case. Um, now, of course, you can have lasers, right? I mean, so you can have things that are, are pretty coherent. Um, and you can, in fact, I mean, if you get a nice laser, you can, if you sort of stand transversely to it, you can't see it. There's no dust around. So, very little is getting away from this, this coherent beam, but actually writing down a solution where none gets away is something that I, I don't think anyone knows how to do, and it's not clear that it's possible. Um, and so this leads to the following embarrassment, which is that we've got these theorems that say that small bodies move on GOD6, and then if we want to say, so for instance, in some appropriate limit, Maxwell fields follow null GOD6, we can't say, look at the theorem. We have to come up with some sort of hand wavy optical limit arguments where you know, we associate some null curve with the solution, and we argue, well, we argue that in some sense the solution is following that, that curve without really being precise about what that sense is. Um, you see this, for instance, in, in Wald's book, where you know, he cites the Darrow Jang theorem, and then you know, 10 pages later gives this completely different argument about electromagnetism. Okay. So um, that's some sense where the, where the situation is, and here's where the work with um, Garage picks up. So the, the question that I want to ask is, is there's some sense in which I can combine these two approaches, the distributional approach and the curve first approach, um, to come up with a way to extend both of them, try to get the benefits of both. Um, ideally, I'd like to do it in a way that doesn't make things more complicated than you need to be. One of the virtues of both of these approaches was they were very simple. Um, and the answer I want to suggest is yes, and here's a proposal for how to do it. It involves this, the following notion that we're calling tracking. Um, so suppose that we're given, in some space time, a collection of smooth symmetric we suppose that each of them satisfies the dominant energy condition. Um, each of these fields, as a smooth field, determines a distribution, right? So it determines uh, an action on smooth test fields. So always an order zero distribution. Every smooth tensor field gives rise to an order zero distribution. And its action is defined in this way. Um, take your test field, which is secretly a density. Um, contract it with TAB, and integrate it over the manifold. Your test fields all have compact support, so this integral is always well-defined. This gives me a, a well-defined distributional action. Now, let's say that this collection of smooth fields tracks a time-like curve. <laughs> if for every smooth test field XAB, which satisfies the dual energy condition in some neighborhood of gamma, if I define gamma, give me a curve. Oh yeah, well it tracks the time-like curve gamma. If for some smooth, if for every smooth test field X satisfying the dual energy condition in the neighborhood of gamma, there's some field in my collection whose action on that test field is strictly positive. So here's a picture of what this is supposed to be capturing. I've got my curve. Now the idea is that since all of the um, fields T A B in this collection satisfy the dominant energy condition, their action on any test field that satisfies the dual energy condition will always be positive. And so I can think of any test field satisfying the dual energy condition as giving me some way, not a canonical way, but some way of measuring how much matter is present in a region. Right, so just give me your favorite, your favorite test field satisfying the dual energy condition, act on it with T, I'll get some number. Give me another t, act on the same test field, I'll get another number. If that number is bigger, then there's some sense in which, by the standard set by this particular test field, there's more matter 
represented by the second energy momentum tensor. Of course, um, if I take minus a, a, a test field that satisfies the dual energy condition, um, that's going to give me a negative number. And so suppose that I have near my curve two test fields, one of which is supported in this blue box, and one of which is supported further out. And I have um, both of them satisfy the dual energy. I can think of for any particular energy momentum tensor, it's action on Z, the one in the blue box, as telling me how much matter is near the curve. And it's action on Y as telling me how much matter is a bit further away from the curve. Now take the difference of Z and Y. That tells me how much more matter is near the curve than away from the curve. But of course, Z minus Y is going to be precisely the sort of test field that satisfies the dual energy condition in a neighborhood of gamma, but perhaps not everywhere. So now what tracking is doing is saying, suppose, given any way you like, of saying how much matter is nearby versus how much matter is far away, for any region near the curve you like and any region far away from the curve if you like. If I can find a T in my collection, that according to that standard says there's more matter near the curve than away from the curve, that collection tracks the curve. So in other words, what, what this notion is doing is capturing a sense in which within my collection C, there are fields that are um, have, uh, have their matter concentrated as close to gamma as I like. Okay, given this notion, we get the following theorem. Suppose that I've got a space-time, a time-like curve therein, and some collection of smooth symmetric fields satisfying the dominant energy condition uh, and divergence free. Suppose that that collection tracks gamma. It follows that there's a sequence of fields in that collection. Um, or there's a sequence of fields, each some positive multiple of an element of that collection that converges in the sense of distributions to uh, u, u, delta gamma. This point particle, this, this distribution representing a, a point particle um, that I've already described. It follows from the two-line argument concerning distributions that the curve must be a geodesic. So what's going on here? Well, um, uh, uh, so here to provide us the very small modification, the same result holds for null curves. And moreover, uh, if I like, I can drop the requirement that gamma is time-like or null, because in fact, the only curves that um, a collection of fields satisfying the dominant energy conditioner can track are time-like or null curves. Okay, so what this result is telling us is that if you give me any family of bodies at all, and you make precise the sense in which that collection of bodies can be concentrated near a curve, the sense in which that, that, body, that collection of bodies can be made to collapse down onto the curve. It follows that um, within that collection is, are some that, that um, converge to this point particle distribution, the delta function, uh, supported on the curve. Um, in other words, every sequence of smooth, symmetric, divergence-free fields satisfying the dominant energy condition, whose support in an appropriate test approaches the curve, converges to this particular distribution. And so I want to claim that this gives a very nice sense in which I can think of that distribution as capturing something, representing something about realistic matter. In particular, it is the essentially unique accumulation point for energy momentum tensors of small bodies, of any sort at all, as long as these things are, um, their support is approaching the curve. This distribution uh, approximates their motion. Now, I claim that it also immediately reproduces the Garrett Yang uh, result in the following sense. If I have um, for every neighborhood of a curve, a smooth, symmetric, non-vanishing divergence field TAB, right? So I have the antecedent to the Garrosh-Yang theorem. 
the collection of bodies um, thus defined automatically tracks the curved gamma. Um, and so the Garrow Jank theorem is just an immediate corollary. Anytime I come up with a collection of tracks, I get this convergence, and the curve is too decent. So the Garrow Jank theorem gives me one such collection. Um, I can recover the Euler Garrow theorem in uh, a similar fashion. It requires a little more setup. But Um, okay, so I think that this does two things for us. The first thing it does is it clarifies the physical content of the distributional approach. Um, the second thing that it does is it gives us a connection between the distributional approach and the curve-first approach in a way that then lets us extend the curve-first approach um, in two important ways. Um, the first important way is that by giving us a relationship between the distributions and the smooth fields that are ultimately going to be approximated by the distribution, um, I get a new insight into how to think about forced motion. In particular, I learn that, um, well, what's going on in these results is that I'm seeing from the distributions what kinds of degrees of freedom uh, I can have in the limit. Um, and so the idea is that I can use the distributional results to pick out what sorts of degrees of freedom on the way to the limit are going to prevent convergence, or alternatively, um, could lead to ambiguity about what distribution I'm going to converge to. Um, and so we already see that, in fact, in the first theorem that I mentioned. Because, um, I, as I say, we only get convergence up to some scaling, so up to multiples by some, some number, some positive number. Um, and the idea is that the distributions that I can support on a geodesic uh, are, or the order zero distributions I can support on a, a geodesic um, are uh, all related to one another by multiplication by some constant number. And so that's giving me this information that the thing that I need to worry about in determining whether or not I'm going to get convergence in this sort of setup uh, is whether or not all of these things are appropriately normalized on the way to the limit. And if I can control that normalization, then I'm going to get a unique limiting result. Things become more complicated in the force case, um, but the same sorts of ideas hold. So for instance, the general force cases we saw, um, I have these two equations, one of which is naturally interpreted as f equals ma, but the other of which is this mass exchange. It's going to be completely hopeless to get a limiting result for a general force unless I've, I've specified that all the bodies in my collection are exchanging mass with their environment in the same way. So that gives me some now hint as to what sorts of results I can try to look for. So, one of the things we learned in the electromagnetic case is that uh, if I allow the completely general case, then I have to worry about electric and magnetic dipole moments. But those are the only things I have to worry about in the limit. So those are the only degrees of freedom left over once I consider an order of jet. Um, and that gives us the following result. That insight gives us the following result. Suppose that I have a collection now of pairs um, of smooth fields, T and J where each T satisfies the dominant energy condition, um, and we have the following relationship on all of the pairs. Um, we'll say that a number kappa, some positive number kappa, bounds the charge to mass ratio of the elements of C. Um, if for any unit time-like vector I can come up with, uh, and any pair, this result holds. In effect, the charge density is determined by an observer with four velocity given by T, is less than or equal to the mass energy density, or kappa times the mass energy density, determined by that same observer. Now, different observers are going to generally have different results for the energy momentum density and for the charge density. But it can be the case that for all observers, um, they all agree that the charge to mass ratio is less than some number. So this is a condition that's satisfied, for instance, by any matter constructed out of electrons and protons and so on. Um, 
I've got two kinds of, of matter fields, and each of them has bounded charge to mass <laughs> ratio, and I somehow make them interact with one another. Um, their sum will always have bounded charge to mass ratio. So this is a, a, the sort of thing that seems to be satisfied by realistic charge matter. Um, and it turns out that that condition, the idea that all of the bodies in our collection have bounded charge to mass ratio with the same bound, uh, is exactly what we need to eliminate dipole contributions in the limit. Um, okay, and so here's, here's a, a sort of Garrosh-Yang-Ehlers type of theorem for the Lorentz force law. Suppose that I've got a space-time, I've fixed some background anti-symmetric tensor field F on the manifold, and I take some time like curve gamma. Um, suppose I have a collection of pairs, I suppose that the T's satisfy the dominant energy condition, the J's are all divergence-free, and each pair together satisfies um, the extended matter version of the Lorentz force law. Um, suppose that this collection has charge and mass ratio bounded by some number of kappa, and suppose that it tracks gamma. It follows now that there's a sequence of pairs, each a positive multiple of some element of C, uh, that converges to the pair consisting of the delta function supported on gamma and kappa prime times u times the delta function supported on gamma, right? So point particle energy momentum tensor and a point particle charge current tensor. Where that number kappa prime is less than or equal to kappa, the thing that bounds the charge to mass ratio. Um, and it follows immediately from that, from the distributional results already described, that gamma is a Lorentz force curve with charge to mass ratio kappa prime. So this captures the sense in which uh, the sorts of reasoning, once we understand how these limits work, the sorts of reasoning that we use in the Garrosh Yang theorem or the Ehlers Garrosh theorem can be extended to, for instance, the Lorentz force law. So that's one way in which tracking allows us to extend the curve first results. Here's the other. Um, now, I sort of emphasize the way in which these theorems um, strengthen the consequent of the curve first results, in the sense of saying that I actually get convergence to some distributional limit. They also weaken the premises, and this is an important thing to recognize, because what this tracking condition is doing for us is saying um, within particular compact regions, I have more matter near the curve than away from the curve. But in some sense, I'm not putting any global constraints at all. First of all, I'm not requiring that there be any region in which matter actually vanishes. Um, I'm just saying that in any region I like, I can find a TAB where the matter in that region is arbitrarily small, or the amount of matter in that region is arbitrarily small. Um, and that means that I can use these results to study uh, solutions of hyperbolic systems, such as the Maxwell equations or the Klein-Gordon equations. And so, for instance, um, if C is the collection of energy momentum tensors associated with solutions of the source-free Maxwell equations on a globally hyperbolic space-time, it follows just from Maxwell's equations that every element of C is divergence-free and satisfies the dominant energy condition. It immediately follows from results already stated that those um, energy momentum tensors can only track time like a null G of E6. Now, there's an important thing to note here, which is that I'm not saying anything about the convergence properties of the solutions. I'm talking about the convergence properties of the energy momentum tensors associated with those solutions. I don't claim anything about the distributional limit of solutions to Maxwell equations. But I am claiming that I can concentrate the electromagnetic fields, I can get wave packet solutions that, for as long as I like, as close to the curve as I like, the electromagnetic field is concentrated. Um, and that gives me that the energy momentum tensors track the curve. Um, or actually, I haven't said that yet. Insofar as I can do that, they can only track time like a null geodesics. And in fact, they track all null geodesics and no time like geodesics. So, what this means is that there exists. Is that five minutes? What does that mean? <laughs>
Which five? If you wanna, if you wanna have like a, about half an hour for discussion. That's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um. <clears throat> okay, so uh, there exists a sequence of electromagnetic fields whose energy momentum tensors converge in this way on null GOD6. Um, I want to claim that this captures uh, precisely the sense in which um, light rays follow null GOD6 um, as a consequence of this general result of <coughs> GOD6 motion. Um, uh, here's another similar kind of result, if you give me the collection of energy momentum tensors associated with solutions of the mass m for fixed m fine Gordon equation. Uh, once again, it's automatic that those energy momentum tensors are divergence free and satisfy the dominant energy condition. I claim that they track all null geodesics and no time-like geodesics for fixed m. All right, now you're thinking, hold on a second, I want small bodies to follow time-like geodesics, not null geodesics. Okay, what's going on here is that if I've got a solution to the mass of klein gordon equation, um, basically in order to make that solution get closer to a curve, I have to speed it up. And uh, what that means is that in the limit as the wave packets become arbitrarily close to the curve, the velocity diverges, or not diverges, approaches C. Um, but the reason that that's happening is because I fixed the mass, and as these things are getting, the support of these things are getting smaller, they're, um, when I integrate the fields over that region to get a total inertial mass, that's actually going to zero, um, because m is, is a constant. Um, so what I really need to do now is consider a slightly different situation where I have the collection of solutions Klein-Gordon equation for all m. And if I do that, I claim that that collection tracks all time like n, all null GOD6, but only time like n, null GOD6. Similar results hold for the charge Klein-Gordon equation, where I consider uh, all m and all e, but fix the charge to mass ratio. Okay, so in the negative time left to me, uh, let me say what all of this means. Um, okay, so as Eleanor just argued, um, as I think other people have, have also felt, there's an important sense in which inertial structure, encapsulated, for instance, by the geodesic principle, provides a link between physics and <coughs> geometry, right? So between motion and physical geometry of space-time. Um, in particular, it identifies a certain geometrically privileged class of curves with a certain dynamically privileged class of curves. Right, the geodesics of space-time with the inertial trajectories of matter. Um, and moreover, there's this famous result due to Weil that one can, in a sense, go in the other direction. That if you give me all of, and Eleanor mentioned this as well, if you give me all of the time-like and null geodesics on a space-time, uh, there's a unique metric up to an overall constant, such that those can be the time like and null geodesics of that metric. So there's really a lot of information encapsulated in the collection of curves uh, that we identify as inertial trajectories in relativity theory. Um, but the geodesic principle, which is supposed to give us this link, uh, concerns the counterfactual behavior of impossible objects. So you might think that that's sort of unsatisfying about that. I, I claim that tracking um, allows us to state what we mean more nicely um, in a way that, that avoids some of the conceptual issues I think associated with point particles in the theory. It allows us to in fact state a kind of version of the geodesic principle, um, an assertion about inertial motion that allows us to refer to matter field equations. So here's the alternative statement. Let's suppose that, uh, I mean, let, let's, let's replace the geodesic principle or understand the geodesic principle in the following terms. The energy momentum tensors associated with solutions to source free matter field equations track only time like and null geodesics. So that captures a sense in which this class of curves is picked out dynamically without ever saying anything about point particles. It's just something about the limiting behavior of solutions to field equations. 
Now, in fact, based on what I've already said, that version of the theorem, or the, the, the principle, is almost a theorem just as stated. I don't have to do any massaging to figure out what I meant by point particles or motion or so on. Um, now, it's going to hold automatically for any system of field equations for which the energy momentum tensors uh, associated with source-free solutions satisfy the following two conditions. If they're divergence-free with respect to, in particular, the space-time derivative operator. That's the important thing here, right? That's the thing that's doing the work in these results. I get it's the geodesics of the derivative operator with respect to, TA, with respect to which TAB is divergence-free that these things are going to end up tracking. Uh, and to satisfy the dominant energy condition. Okay, so let's just very briefly discuss those two conditions and when we would expect them to hold. Um, conservation, I claim, is going to hold uh, quite generally. Right? So if you just give me some species of matter in space-time, we suppose that its dynamics, its field equations, uh, can be derived from Hamilton's principle. Right? So uh, you know, these are the, the oil of the branch equations of uh, that I get by extremizing some action, um, where that action can be understood. This is what I mean by non-interacting. The action depends just on the field, its covariant derivatives, and the metric G. It follows that any solution to those Euler-Lagrange equations on the space-time MG uh, is going to have the property that this field, this smooth symmetric field TAB, which I define in a particular way um, by varying this Lagrangian with respect to the metric, um, is divergence-free with respect to the derivative operator compatible with the unique metric appearing in that Lagrangian. And so what's going on here is that um, matter whose field equations can be derived in this way uh, is such that it has an energy momentum tensor that is always conserved relative to the derivative operator compatible with the metric appearing in its own dynamics. And so what we see is that it's the metric that, in effect, determines the notions of length and duration and angle and so on, the geometry, in effect, that's salient to the evolution of this body, that also determines the, the notion of conservation that we're going to get. Um, and so if I start with matter that satisfies field equations in, in which that's the background geometry that the matter sees, it's going to follow that its energy momentum tensor is conserved relative to that derivative operator. And then, modulo the energy condition, the solutions are going to track only the time like and null geodesics of that derivative operator. Um, okay, but now let's talk about the energy condition very, very briefly. I only have one slide on this. The last slide says I'm minus five minutes now. Okay. Uh, the dominant energy condition is playing two roles here. Um, it's enforcing causality. Remember, I said that uh, energy momentum tensors um, satisfying the dominant energy condition can only track time like and null geodesics. So, in effect, the dominant energy condition prohibits uh, solutions to differential equations from tracking space like curves. And in that sense, is uh, enforcing a kind of causality condition. It also enforces positivity. And this is really essential to this whole setup, right? Because the idea behind tracking is that I've got some class of tensor fields, of, of test fields, that by virtue of always giving a positive result on uh, the energy momentum tensors I'm interested in, allow me to compare the amount of stuff present in different regions in an ambiguous way. And so the energy condition, by enforcing that positivity constraint, is what's allowing me to set up the limit in this particular way in the first place. <laughs> um, now, there are lots of ways of enforcing positivity. For instance, the weak energy condition would allow me to enforce positivity in a very similar way. Um, perhaps, I'm not sure about this, perhaps the null energy condition would also do. The strong energy condition certainly would. Um, and so in that sense, the dominant energy condition isn't playing a particular role here, just some energy condition or other is necessary. Causality, though, requires specifically the dominant energy condition. Weaker energy conditions don't seem to do it for that. Um, okay, so 
the dominant energy condition holds automatically in the example that I discussed. It holds automatically for many fields that we care about, not just, you know, so all the Yang Mills fields, for instance, it holds automatically for, in addition to Maxwell fields and, and positive mass Klein Gordon fields. But it doesn't hold for everything. And so it doesn't hold for the Dirac equation, for instance. In fact, the weak energy condition doesn't hold for solutions to the Dirac equation. Um, and so here's an interesting question. If you think electrons follow the Lorentz force, or satisfy the Lorentz force, um, why? I mean, why do they do that? I mean, so it, you can't think of them, I guess, as represented by uh, classical Dirac fields. Um, in, in any case, I think that there are interesting questions there. Um, but there, there are real issues about uh, whether there are some fields for which this sort of argument doesn't work. Um, but there's a more general question. Can we say something about the class of matter field equations for which the associated energy momentum tensor automatically satisfies the energy condition? And in particular, if there's some sense in which the dominant energy condition is related to hyperbolicity of a system of equations. So here's something that's true if you have a hyperbolic system I can always find, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's what I mean by the system admitting a hyperbolization, is that there exists some positive definite bilinear form on fields of the sort that are candidates to be solutions to the field equations. Um, that positive definite bilinear form on fields, in the Maxwell case, in the Klein Gordon case, simply is the energy momentum tensor. And so the positivity of the hyperbolization. Um, is precisely what gets me that the dominant energy condition is satisfied. And so one question you can ask, I don't know the answer to this, is uh, Dirac fields have a hyperbolization? Is that hyperbolization the sort of thing that I could put into this kind of construction? I mean, forget about the energy momentum tensor. Is this positive quantity the sort of thing that could guarantee that solutions track time-like curves? I, I don't know. Um, more generally, what's the relationship between a hyperbolic system that matter field, the matter field satisfy, having causal cones that coincide with the um, metric light cones, and the satisfaction of the dominant energy equation? Again, I don't know. Thanks.